Today, we are going to the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Bennett Clark Hyde was born in 1872 in Missouri and grew up in the small city of Lexington, which is about 40 miles east of Kansas City. His father was a Baptist minister and made sure that his son received a good education. And when he finished school, the young Bennett Clark Hyde went on to study medicine at the University Medical College in Kansas City. When he graduated, he started working at the college and by 1898, he held the position of demonstrator of anatomy. However, for him to be able to successfully teach, he needed bodies to enable the students to have practical training. And soon after he took up his position, the police saw a big increase in the number of graves being robbed in the city. Dr. Hyde was far too intelligent to rob graves himself. But when the police eventually arrested two men for the crime, they both made statements that they had been robbing bodies on the instruction of Dr. Hyde. The doctor was arrested and interviewed by police. He of course denied all knowledge of the crimes, but the police continued to investigate the allegations. Eventually, with lack of any real evidence, the police ended their interest in Dr. Hyde in 1899. In May 1905, Dr. Hyde became the Kansas City police surgeon and a month later, on June the 21st, 1905, he married Frances Swope, who was the daughter of Mrs. Margaret Swope and the niece of the very wealthy Colonel Thomas Swope. Colonel Thomas Swope was an elderly bachelor with an estimated net worth of $3.5 million. He was born in 1827 in Lincoln County, Kentucky. In 1848, he went to study law at Yale. After he graduated, he started to invest in real estate and mining in New York and St. Louis before moving to Kansas City in 1857. Here he began purchasing land and property and eventually became the largest individual landowner in the area. As time passed, the city grew and his land became much more valuable. So he started selling it in small lots, which increased its price and meant that Thomas accumulated more and more wealth. Although he was known as Colonel, the title was not due to any military service. In 1896, Thomas donated 1,334 acres of land to be used as a public park, and the city named the park after him and called it Swope Park. Thomas lived in a very large house on Pleasant Street in Independence. He lived with his sister-in-law and her seven children. Thomas's brother named Logan had died in 1900, so Thomas took it upon himself to look after his nieces and nephews. He also let his cousin live in the house, who was called James Moss Hunton. By now his niece Frances had married Dr. Bennett Clark Hyde and had moved out of the family home. Her mother was very much against her marriage to the doctor. She was aware of the previous accusations against him and thought that he was only marrying her daughter for any future inheritance that she might come into. Thomas and his sister-in-law took over a year to accept Dr. Hyde as one of the family. But in the summer of 1906, Thomas paid $7,500 for a home at 3516 Forest Avenue, Kansas City, as a gift for his niece and her husband. A year later, in September 1907, Dr. Hyde was dismissed from his position as Kansas City police surgeon for alleged improper behavior. Despite his background, Dr. Hyde was a well-liked member of the community, and many people seemed totally unaware of his previous dealings. In September 1909, Thomas Swope fell over, and although he was not seriously injured, it made him realise that he was not invincible and that he should get all of his financial affairs in order. He was now 81 years old and spent the next few weeks rarely leaving his home. Concerned for his well-being, Dr Hyde employed a nurse named Pearl Keller 
to care for him. The family were well aware that Thomas had made very generous provisions for them all in his will and that some of his estate would be given to various charities and charitable projects. His will stated that nine of his ten nieces and nephews would each receive about $200,000 with the exception of Francis who was to receive $135,000. There was also a residuary fund worth nearly $1.5 million which was to be divided between his nieces and nephews. However, Thomas was considering changing this part of his will and reassigning it to different charities. This would mean that his nieces and nephews would receive less money, including his niece Frances, who was married to Dr Hyde. Following Thomas's fall, Dr Hyde would often call on him at the house to see how his condition was improving and the two men would spend some time talking. Thomas informed the doctor of his plan to change his will and leave more of his fortune to good causes. He also told him that he had named two attorneys, his cousin, James Moss Hunton, and his oldest nephew, Chris Swope, to be the executors of his estate. And Thomas had decided to ask his cousin to assist him in changing his will. On the evening of October the 1st, 1909, James Moss Hunton was eating his dinner when suddenly he collapsed. Mrs. Swope immediately sent for their doctor, a well-known and well-respected physician named Dr. Twyman. Mrs. Swope also sent for her son-in-law, Dr. Hyde. Both men quickly arrived and on examining the patient, they both agreed that he had suffered a case of apoplexy. They thought that the correct treatment should be bloodletting to relieve the pressure on the brain. Dr. Hyde then began to draw one pint of blood from the patient's arm. Dr. Twyman told him that this was a sufficient amount, but Dr. Hyde continued to draw more blood. Francis Hyde and Miss Keller, the nurse, were both present as Dr. Twyman continued to advise Dr. Hyde to stop drawing the blood from the patient, but Dr. Hyde continued to ignore his instruction. Eventually he stopped. His treatment proved ineffective and shortly after, James Moss Hunton died. Following this terrible incident, Dr. Hyde asked Miss Keller if she would suggest to Thomas that he replace the unfortunate James Moss Hunton as the new executor on Thomas's will. He knew that Thomas was fond of the nurse and he thought that if Thomas realised that the nurse thought well of Dr Hyde, that he might give it some serious consideration. But Nurse Keller refused his request. The death of his cousin had a negative effect on Thomas and he decided to spend the next two days in bed. Apparently concerned about his health, Dr Hyde asked the nurse to give him a digestive tablet, which she did, but instead of helping him, it made him very sick. His condition quickly started to deteriorate and Nurse Keller fetched Dr Hyde, who concluded that Thomas had also suffered from apoplexy, probably caused by all the anxiety over his cousin's untimely death. The nurse was not convinced about this, as she considered the symptoms to be completely different. Dr Hyde did not inform Thomas's physician, Dr Twyman, about Thomas's sudden change in health. And around 7pm the same evening, Sunday, October the 3rd, 1909, Thomas Hunt and Swope died. In December the same year, the Swope family received more misfortune when eight nieces and nephews, who were all beneficiaries of her late uncle's will, became ill. And when they were examined, it was confirmed that they had typhoid. On December the 6th, the eldest nephew of the late Thomas Hunt and Swope, named Chrisman Swope, died, and his symptoms had a disturbing resemblance to those suffered by his late uncle. It was known to everyone that if any unmarried beneficiary of the will died before the estate had been settled, then their portion would be divided by the remaining beneficiaries. 
Strangely though, the night his brother-in-law died, Dr. Hyde attended a banquet given in celebration of his election of president of the Jackson County Medical Society. The family thought it strange that they were all suffering typhoid-like symptoms, yet Dr. Hyde and his family were not. And the doctor always seemed to be giving them tablets, injections and medicine, which usually made them feel worse. The family hired nurses to look after them while they were poorly. The nurses, however, very quickly became suspicious of Dr. Hyde and wondered if Dr. Hyde was responsible for all the illnesses in the Swope family. And it hadn't gone unnoticed that when the doctor, his wife and children visited the house, they would only drink bottled water. The nurses spoke to Dr. Twyman who agreed to speak to Dr. Hyde. And it was agreed that during this period of illness, he would not return to the Swope home. And instead, Dr. Twyman would be solely responsible for the well-being of the family. Mrs. Margaret Swope had always been very wary of her son-in-law and had always questioned the motive for him marrying her daughter. And now she was convinced that the death of her eldest son and her brother-in-law were due to him so she went to the police and informed them of the strange events that had occurred in her household and her concerns that Dr Hyde would stop at nothing to get his hands on Thomas's fortune. Margaret Swope was a very well thought of member of the community and her late brother-in-law was a very large benefactor to the city. So the police took her concerns very seriously and the bodies of Thomas Swope and his nephew, Chrisman, were exhumed and examined for traces of poison. First, an autopsy was performed on the body of Chrisman Swope. The death certificate produced by Dr Hyde suggested the cause of death was due to cerebral meningitis, but the autopsy found that the brain was perfectly healthy, so this was incorrect. Strychnine was found in the liver, but the concentrations were not high enough to prove that Dr Hyde had knowingly poisoned the young man. They also found evidence of typhoid, but in such small amounts, it could not have brought about his death. Next, they conducted the autopsy on the body of Thomas Swope, who similarly to his nephew, had been certified by Dr. Hyde to have died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Again, the autopsy showed the brain to be in a very healthy condition. It did, however, reveal that there was strychnine in Thomas's liver and more than enough to be fatal. The police wanted to find more evidence, so continued their investigation and discovered that one of Dr Hyde's colleagues, named Dr Edward Stewart, had given Dr Hyde a test tube filled with typhoid culture on November the 10th, 1909. Dr Hyde had assured him that this was only going to be used for an experiment that he was undertaking this was very interesting for the police, but when they came across a chemist who confirmed that he had provided Dr Hyde with quite large quantities of cyanide and strychnine, the police thought they had enough evidence to charge their suspect and Dr Hyde was arrested and charged with the murder of Thomas and Chrisman Swope. The trial began on April the 16th, 1910 and Dr Hyde's very wealthy wife, Frances, forever loyal to her husband, hired the best lawyers available to defend him. The case dominated the press, who printed headlines about the mother v daughter trial, and the story was front page news in Kansas and across America. Nearly 50 witnesses testified for the prosecution, and the evidence against the defendant seemed overwhelming, and on May the 4th, the prosecution rested its case. Dr Hyde's defence said that Thomas Swope was nearly 82 years of age and the grief from the death of his cousin brought on a stroke. They also claimed that the rest of the Swope family became ill due to the water they had been drinking in their home. Despite the defence lawyer's best attempts to establish doubt in the minds of the jurors, it was hard to explain why the defendant had purchased typhoid samples shortly before the outbreak of the disease in the Swope mansion. It was also strange 
that all of Dr. Hyde's family had avoided any illness when the whole Swope family had fallen ill. The jury retired to consider their verdict on Friday, May the 13th, 1910, and on May the 16th, they returned to give their verdict. They found the defendant, Bennett Clark Hyde, guilty. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. After the trial ended, one juror told the press that Dr. Hyde's own testimony convinced him of his guilt. But Dr. Hyde's wife, Frances, was convinced of her husband's innocence and instructed her lawyers to appeal the verdict. They did this in September 1910, citing 255 errors in the case and questioning the competence of the poison experts who testified for the prosecution. A second trial was ordered, which began in October 1911, and after eight weeks came to an abrupt and bizarre halt. Around midnight on December the 11th, a juror named Harry Warden crawled through a small window in his hotel room and slipped down the fire escape. The police eventually found him and he said that he had become agitated and nervous earlier in the day when he saw his children and wife in the courtroom. He said he could no longer stand being there. The second trial was then declared to be a mistrial and while for some the poor juror's anxiety attack seemed to be genuine, many people thought that it was an act paid for by the defendant's loyal wife in order to get the proceedings stopped. A third trial started in January 1913, but it ended in a hung jury. And again, there were rumours that some of the jurors had been bought. Prosecutors called for a fourth trial, but in 1917, the state declared that they had dropped all charges against Dr. Bennett Clark Hyde. In 1920, Dr. Hyde's wife, Frances, who had financed his defence since his arrest in 1909, filed for divorce and Dr. Hyde left the family home. He moved back to Lexington and set up a small doctor's practice. He lived there until August the 8th, 1934, when he died of apoplexy. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I will see you in the next brief case.